Right, how are we doing with the with the um, setup, Ronald? All good, right. So have a have Luke six open in front of you, and we'll read from verse seventeen to verse twenty six. But before we read it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can speak of a king and a kingdom tonight, that we're not just drifting through life, making up stuff as we go along, but there is purpose to everything we do, for we seek to serve uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we look at your words, help us to hear from you, to have those ears that, that hear. Where is the, the encouragement we need to hear tonight? Where is the challenge? We ask that it would come from your spirit. Help us to, to hear what your spirit is saying. Amen. Right, let's, let's read Luke 6, verse 17. So, he went down with them, as in Jesus went down with them, and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said... Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how they, their fathers treated the false prophets. Just a quick thing to say about that, you may have been picking up on this as we've been going through. When you look at all the blessed stuff from verse 20 down to end of verse 23, and then you compare that with all the woe stuff, it's almost like a symmetrical opposites. Like stunningly so, as, as Jesus parallels the, the blessed life with the, the woe life, the woeful situation. So look at what happens when Jesus comes to town. The crowds gather, they're coming from far and wide, and lives are changed as people are, are healed by Jesus and they hear from Jesus. So let's just look at the start of the passage again from verse 17. And just to give you plenty of warning, when I, after all of this and I come out with the first question, the first question will be this, you've got plenty of time to think of an answer, what stood out from you in this passage in a good way or a challenging way or an encouraging way? So basically what stood out in this passage? As we look through, see if anything stands out for you that you'll be able to talk about in a short while. So verse 17, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them, them all. A tremendous scene. 
Imagine if you'd have been there. If you'd have been there, and you, with your own eyes you could see what was happening with Jesus and the, the goodness of the kingdom of God was sweeping across that level place. We start to just get a flavour of what it's like when God's kingly rule overflows into this world. So in verse 18, you can see that disease has to leave. And also in the end of verse 18, you can see that evil has to leave. And it seems like no one misses out on the blessing. In verse 19, Jesus is, it says, healing them all as God's kingdom comes in with the king. Of course, at the moment, we, we know God's kingdom in this world in, in part, and one day we'll know in, in full. And a day is coming when the kingdom comes in all its fullness. And what we see here are just signs of what there's going to be. No evil, no disease, no illness. When God's kingdom finally appears in, in all its fullness, when Jesus returns, all sin, sickness and sadness will be gone. Praise God. If you think about any sin you've known recently, any sickness you're aware of, any sadness you're aware of, there is a day when that will be gone. What we get in Luke 6 is just a foretaste of that kind of life that Jesus is bringing his followers into and on into the new creation one day. When Jesus came to town, he started to get a vision of what the kingdom of God looks like. Disease leaves, evil leaves, and then from verse 20, Jesus goes a bit deeper into what the kingdom of God is like. He begins to speak of how, how we live, how it is in the kingdom of God, that it's the best life, it's the blessed life. Jesus uses the word blessed here quite a lot, doesn't he? And he, he doesn't just mean, it doesn't simply mean smiley, happy people, because we're all smiley and happy, but it's, it's those who enjoy the favour of God, as someone else put it, those who enjoy the favour of God, who are blessed indeed. It must have sounded pretty unusual when Jesus said it though. When Jesus began to explain, here's the blessed life, the best life, and it's being, this is who it's being lived by, the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the hated followers of Jesus. That's the blessed life. It's as if Jesus says, here's, here's the best life, here's the blessed life. It's, it's not, not to be rich, it's not to be well fed, it's not to be laughing and respected, but rather to be a a poor, hungry, weeping, hated follower of mine. Which is the exact opposite of what people would have thought back then, and it's the exact opposite of what most people think today. Surely it's much better, surely, people might object, surely it's much better to do what you want to do with your life, and a thing you'll have heard is like, yeah, just do whatever makes you happy. Just do whatever makes you happy. Isn't it much better to be rich, well-fed, laughing, and respected, which is what we get in this passage. They're the things that Jesus pushes on. But Jesus says, no, you're wrong. The best life, the blessed life, and some of you will know this, the best life is to follow Jesus whatever the cost. Whatever it costs you. It's totally upside down and opposite of what, as humans, we usually think things should be like. Welcome to the upside down community of Jesus, which is actually life the right way up. So Jesus has established in chapter 6 his community leaders as the 12 disciples, and now in verses 17 to 49, we're not covering all of that tonight, but from verses 17 to 49, Jesus starts to explain how his people ought to live the blessed life, enjoying the goodness of God. So let's pick this up from verse 20. 
And it starts with looking at his disciples, he says. So he's looking at his followers and he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the king. You see the word the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you. This is like followers of Jesus. So when it says you, it's any follower of Jesus. In other, in other words, if you're a Christian, you can put your name in there. It means you. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and they reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. So something of a list here of how to experience the, the best life, the blessed life in the kingdom of God. We'll look at these one at a time in a second, but let me deal with something first about if you've ever read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, so from Matthew 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7, you've got the Sermon on the Mount. If you've ever read that, and then you come to Luke 6, you're like, this sounds very familiar. This is ringing quite a few bells. There are quite a few things that are the same or almost the same. Which begs the question, is it basically the same sermon, same time, same place, is that what's going on? Like Luke is writing about exactly the same sermon and Matthew is writing about exactly the same teaching that happened at the same occasion, just one time, one place, just writing from different perspectives. Okay, I, I like R.C. Sproul's answer to this one. He says this, uh, there are many similarities to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and some see Luke 6 as a variant of the same sermon, like the exact same occasion and all that. But the thing is, this sermon is much shorter in Luke. And Luke has, if you've read a bit of Luke, you'll know that Luke has parts of Matthew 5 to 7 elsewhere in Luke's Gospel. So the conclusion Sproul comes to, and I would... I would side with this one, you may have a slightly different conclusion, it says it, it is more likely that Jesus used similar material on a number of occasions. So that Jesus talked about, for example, loving your enemies on more than one occasion. Which is a practice common amongst preachers back then and today. Some of you will preach in different chapels and you'll take the same sermon to this chapel and then they also need to hear it over here, and this one. I know my dad does a bit of that. So I, I would say that Luke is, what we read in Luke here, Luke 6, is very, very similar to what we get in the Sermon on the Mount. But I don't think it's the same sermon, same time, same place, just one sermon that Jesus ever gave on these matters. You may differ with me on that, uh, but that's, that's where I'm landing on this. Okay, so let's go back to the list here that we have of ways to experience the best life, the blessed life in the kingdom of God. And starting from verse 20, it says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So what does this mean? Just to be clear, what it doesn't mean is that every single person on the face of planet Earth who happens to be poor is automatically blessed. It doesn't mean that. Just because you, it, Jesus isn't saying, right, if you're really, really poor, you're automatically blessed. He's not saying that. It's something more like this. For true disciples of, of Jesus, compared to Almighty God, we're all poor. We are all poor in many ways. In the end, we have nothing. It ultimately, final analysis, we have nothing, we own nothing, we can keep nothing. It's all God's. Everything belongs to him. And so, for the Christian to recognise that they are poor before God, 
in that way and other ways is a huge blessing for we, we see life like it really is. Ultimately we own nothing, we can't keep anything, it's all his, everything belongs to God. And so in our poverty, true followers of Jesus, they come to God in prayer for everything, to feed us, to lead us, to empower us, and so on and so on. But the thing that I haven't said, and you're all thinking, why don't you say this bit, right? The most important thing is that we see our spiritual poverty, that before God we are sinners in need of his grace, and that to see that poverty, that, yeah, we have, God needs to illuminate that in, in our hearts so we can see how we need God's help with our sin, that we need to come to him asking for his forgiveness if we are ever to enter the kingdom of God. It's the way in to be washed from our sins, to be born again, to be adopted into his family. And so Jesus said in verse 20, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. It's the only way in to recognise our spiritual poverty and to come to God needing his forgiveness. Verse 21, next one. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Those who are hungry for all kinds of things. Again, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Mick Jagger will be satisfied simply because he had a hunger when he said, when he sang, I can't get no satisfaction. It doesn't mean that he's going to be satisfied just because he was hungry for satisfaction. Instead, this is to do with hunger for God. Hunger for the things of God today. To, to seek God, to seek satisfaction in him through Jesus and you will be satisfied, those who are seeking in this way, and you are blessed when we realise Jesus is the one we need. Uh, as he, the, the quote that goes around and around and around, something like this, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. That's the only place for satisfaction. Verse 21, middle of verse 21, it says, blessed are you. Who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you. There's quite a list here. When they hate you, when they exclude you, and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of, basically because of Jesus, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. But that's how they treated, that is how their fathers treated the prophets. Now to try and summarise that, to put it as simply as I can, if you really are suffering for Jesus, that is a great place to be. That is part of the best life, the blessed life, for those who truly are suffering for Jesus. And that includes in verse 21, weeping, verse 22, being hated, excluded, insulted, rejected. In, in Acts, the book of Acts, you find them rejoicing when they've um, had a bit of a, that kind of experience where it's been uh, hard for them, but they're rejoicing. And you'll see why people are willing to go through that kind of thing. At the end of verse 22, it says, because of the Son of Man. In other words, they're suffering for Jesus. Now, why is it such a blessing? Why is it so blessed to be weeping, hated, excluded, insulted, rejected? Well, you know the answer. Because it's for Jesus. What an honour it is to represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And look at why Jesus says, why does Jesus say it's so blessed? Jesus links all of this, the blessing, to how the story ends. Jesus knows what happens with this life and what the ultimate reality is, the ultimate uh, end of the story, if you like, leading into heaven's story. Jesus sees it clearly so he can say, you're blessed 
You might not feel it, but ultimately, you're blessed. Jesus looks at where every faithful Christian is heading, glory and gladness with him in heaven and on into the new creation. And, that's, and so Jesus, when he gets to that future life for us, at the end of verse 21, do you know, I'd never seen this before until I looked at this passage this time, where he says, for you will laugh. I don't know if you like laughing. For you will laugh. You're not just be feeling okay about heaven. Now, like, yeah, it's another day in heaven. Terrific. Uh, good. There's, there's a joy that flows over into laughter. You will laugh. Did you know? Heaven is clearly a place of much joy and laughter. Now, if you like to think of yourself as a miserable old grump, and you really hope that um, heaven's going to suit your, your miserable moods, I am not sorry to disappoint you. Jesus says, you will laugh. You will laugh. The most, um, the true Christian who might be more miserable than, look more miserable than anyone else on their, on their streets, but the true Christian, they will laugh. And there's more to this blessing of suffering for Jesus as we look at how the story ends. Look at verse 23. It says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. I mean laughing and leaping. It doesn't get... You're like, calm down. It's like, it's like David when his dad's not all dignified. He's like, calm down, what are you doing? Leaping for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Um, every true Christian... I mean, you think of the suffering that's gone on over the centuries... And every true Christian who's ever suffered prolonged suffering. Oh, the example that came to me was being burnt, burnt at the stake. Is that the end of the story? Burnt at the stake? And it's like, leaping. What are they doing today? Leaping for joy. Because great is their reward in heaven. Okay, that's the good news. The bad news, we're going to look at the blessed life happy life. Now for the woes, the unblessed, the sad life. Uh, verse 24. We've actually got four of these. Woe to you. Woe to you. Verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets for those who and this can be folks who even call themselves Christians but who refuse to take up the teaching of Jesus and to, to follow in his ways driven on by his spirit if for those of us in the end we live more for ourselves than we do for Jesus because we never really knew Jesus Jesus can only say woe to you. What a phrase, and woe to you. Um, and Jesus says this in verse 24 to those who are rich and comfortable. And he says, woe to you in verse 25 to people who are well fed. You know, the kind of people they eat very well. Probably out right now, I don't know, one of the top restaurants in Derby, eating, eating very well. Um, and then the second part of verse 25, they they love life. They like laughing all the time. Uh, yeah, they're laughing now. Um, and then verse 26, this is a person with a fantastic reputation. A lot of influence in this life in verse 26. Mm -hmm. People speak well of them. That really sounds like the definition of the good life. Right? If, if you're in Derby and you're just walk, wandering around... And someone said, do you know what, um, no catch, I can make you rich, comfortable, well-fed, have a life that you love, and I'll give you a fantastic reputation, loads of influence in this life, for the rest of your life. Most people would take it. And be like, really, is it, is that, can I get that? But Jesus says to all of them, woe to you, the rich, comfortable, well-fed, those who love life, fantastic reputation, how can Jesus say that 
It's, in real terms, it's a bit like Jesus saying something like this. Uh, just examples from the rich, comfortable, and all the rest of it. So I'm going to ask you to switch your imaginations on. And if you think of a rich businessman, right, he's a rich businessman, he's lounging on his massive yacht in the Mediterranean, and he's got a big smile on his face. It's a sunny day, he's got his sun cream on, he's got his cool shade, he's got his cool drink. And it's as if Jesus puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and says, Woe to you. I mean, really? The woe is in this. Woe to you because you're living like this is what life is all about. And not thinking of Jesus at all. It's just like, yep, I'm living for the yacht, living for the Mediterranean lifestyle. Or a bit closer to home. Let's try this one. Picture a bloke who goes to church for years. But Jesus doesn't really mean much to him, even though he, the guy goes to church. What really matters is that he's comfortable. So he, usually, he, just, he does things that keep him comfortable in the church setting. So he tries to keep the wife happy, and uh, nothing wrong with that. He's got his hobbies, nothing wrong with that. Uh, his hobbies take up hours every day. He likes watching a lot of his favourite telly. He's chosen a, a job that pays well, but doesn't have too much hassle. It's all kind of nicely comfortable. The thing is, he's a nice guy, and you, you'd like him. And picture Jesus putting a guy, just putting a hand on that guy's shoulder and saying, woe to you. Woe to you because you're living like this. Comfort is what life is all about. Well, how about this one? Picture a, a lady. And this all fits in with the categories we've got that Jesus has laid out for us. Picture a lady who loves cooking. Nothing wrong with that. She can cook things from scratch. She can cook anything from scratch. And it's always delicious and it always seems to be effortless. Wow. She loves socialising. Nothing wrong with that. She's out three or four nights a week. Her friends love her. She's great at planning things, exciting adventures, classy dinner parties. She loves to laugh, there's nothing wrong with that. She loves life, she's witty, charming and lovable, nothing wrong with that. And she's, she's laughing every day. She's fun to be around and you would like her. And picture Jesus putting a hand on her shoulder and saying, woe to you because you're living like this is what life is all about. Here's a shocking teaching from Jesus. When you think it through, when you think about the implications of what Jesus is saying, it means there are an awful lot of really nice people who we like, who are doing really nice things with their lives, and Jesus would still say to them, up to this moment, woe to you because they're missing the entire point of their existence. Woe, I mean, this isn't just like a kind of, yeah, well that's interesting. These are people we know. Woe to them because they're missing the entire point of their existence. Woe to them because they're in a, they're in a world sinking beneath the waves of sin and they don't even know it. Woe to them, because they're putting their own desires for, for pleasure and comfort and more of what they want ahead of living for Jesus. Woe to them, because on the day of judgment, they will know, at, the, as, at this current point, it seems they will know nothing of God's favour and only his wrath. How, how can Jesus say, woe to you? Because Jesus saw heaven and hell with great clarity. More than any of us. Like way ahead of any of us. It's like heaven is real. Hell is real. Some people go here. Some people go here. And so he died on a cross. So that we would never have to experience hell. And would eternally experience heaven. But for those who refuse Christ's rescue... 
Jesus has those three simple words, woe to you. <coughs> However good their life looks, woe to you. And for those who turn to Christ in repentance and faith, Jesus says, blessed are you. It is, do you see how it's so black and white? There's no like, oh yeah, and in the middle is this third category of they'll probably be okay. It's like, oh, no, it's, you're, either in, you're either blessed or it's woe. Uh, let me pray before we have a look at any questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you reached down uh, in the person of your Son. We thank you that, that you sent your Son, sorry, sent your Son Jesus to make a way for us and that your spirit has uh, opened our hearts to receive this message and we thank you that we can think of our own lives and think because of Jesus, because of your great plan, because of your spirit uh, opening our eyes, that we can think yes we, we are blessed completely undeserving and yet so blessed magnificently eternally and we thank you so much Lord help us as we seek to reach out to those who as far as we know they don't know you yet help us to be increasingly effective ambassadors in your kingdom as we seek to hold out the word of life to people with our lifestyles, with our words, help as we pray. And um, Father, with the folks that we know from, from church who have often come regularly to things and would be clear that they are not followers of yours, Father, we ask for a breakthrough in those situations. Lord, we thank you with the likes of um, Saul, then known as the Apostle Paul. We thank you that we see in his life how anybody can be saved. It's, so we, we do ask for a breakthrough with, with people that we know and have been praying for for ages and uh, who seem to be uh, set against the good news and resistant to the good news. We ask that they would completely cave in to your good news, your wonderful news, and see it for as good as it is, and as life-giving as it is, and that they would start to walk in that life and freedom as your spirit gives them that new life. Amen. Oh,